Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm here with Andreas Carlin. Is that how you pronounce it correctly? Yeah, he doesn't really much. <laughs> Close <Carlin>. enough. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, today we're going to discuss uh, the Diamond Sutra. We're going to play through it. And uh, if anything comes up of interest to him that might... Uh, you know, he might want to delve in deeper. Uh, I'm going to kind of serve as giving my perspective based on someone who's been doing the practices associated with this type of a spiritual teaching. Uh, and we're just kind of going to do this as a conversational format, but with that uh, text as the basis of the conversation. Uh, is there anything you want to add uh, quickly? No, I'm just... End? Uh, I, yeah, I'm not that into Buddhist philosophy, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious what it's going to say. But uh, of course, I have my own perspective on things. So, uh, I mean, I, I know a little bit about this idea of uh, of the no self. I guess that comes from Buddhism primarily. Yeah, uh, no self or anatta. It's a pretty big part of it. So. Anyway, um, are you ready to start with the, the audio? Book? Yeah, sure. Just yeah. pause at points where, where you feel like you would like to discuss something or if there's like a question that arises. I've listened to this many times, so I'm pretty familiar. But if anything comes up you think would be interesting to discuss, uh, I'll, I'll kind of let you lead with that. At one time the Buddha was staying in the Jetta Grove near the city of Shravasti. With him there was a community of 1,250 venerable monks and devoted disciples. One day before dawn, the Buddha clothed himself and along with his disciples, took up his arms bowl and entered the city to beg for food door to door as was his custom. After he had returned and eaten, he put away his bowl and cloak, bathed his feet and then sat with his legs crossed and body upright upon the seat arranged for him. He began mindfully fixing his attention in front of himself while many monks approached the Buddha and showing great reverence seated themselves around him. Chapter 2 After a time, a most venerable monk named Subhuti, who was sitting in the congregation, rose from his seat. He uncovered his right shoulder, placed his right knee on the ground, and as he joined his palms together, he respectfully bowed and then addressed the Buddha. Most honoured one, it is truly majestic how much knowledge and wisdom your monks and disciples have been given through your most inspired teachings. It is remarkable that you look after our welfare so selflessly and so completely. Most honoured one, I have a question to ask you. If sons and daughters of good families want to develop the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind, if they wish to attain the highest perfect wisdom, what should they do to help quiet their drifting minds and help subdue their craving thoughts? The Buddha then replied, so it is as you say, Subhuti. Monks and disciples have been favoured with the highest favour by the Buddha. The monks and disciples have been instructed with the highest instruction by the Buddha. The Buddha is constantly mindful of the welfare of his followers. Listen carefully with your full attention, and I will speak to your question. If sons and daughters of good families want to develop the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind, if they wish to attain the highest perfect wisdom and quiet their drifting minds while subduing their craving thoughts, then they should follow what I am about to say to you. Those who follow what I am about to say here will be able to subdue their discriminative thoughts and craving desires. It is possible to attain perfect tranquility and clarity of mind by absorbing and dwelling on the teachings that I am about to give. Then the Buddha addressed the assembly. Chapter 3 All living beings, whether born from eggs, from the womb, from moisture or spontaneously, whether they have form or do not have form, whether they are aware or unaware, whether they are not aware or not unaware, all living beings will eventually be led by me to the final nirvana, the final ending of the cycle of birth and death. And when this unfathomable infinite number of living beings have all been liberated, in truth, not even a single being has actually been liberated. Why, Subhuti? Because if a disciple still clings to the arbitrary illusions of form or phenomena, such as an ego, a personality, a self, a separate person or a universal self existing eternally, then that person is not an authentic disciple. Chapter four. Furthermore, 
the way he described the Buddha, like the, the Buddha would help people be liberated, mm -hmm. like every being, I don't know, but it made it seem like the Buddha was some kind of psychological uh, aspect of the mind rather than, I don't know, I don't think they would be referring to like the texts or the teachings alone left behind. Or what is your interpretation of that? Um, my interpretation, so uh, later on in this uh, sutra, we're going to hear basically like uh, one of the questions that kind of gets covered is, you know, can you know the Buddha by his body, for example, or by his mind and other things? And essentially what they get to is that, no, you cannot know the Buddha by these things. And part of the reason for that is that it's going to describe like the nature of the self from a Buddhist perspective, supposedly from the Buddha himself, although the sutta came quite a bit later after, you know, the original suttas. But um, anyway, it, the idea is that the Buddha was a... <laughs> In experience, there was a Buddha that was appearing to exist at that moment. And it was essentially, if you want to break it down uh, in kind of still a little bit of a complex way, though, he was appearing as the Buddha then. But to say that you know the Buddha based on that appearance that occurs then is to kind of miss the point of this school of Buddhism. The idea is that there is no like set point in time where the Buddha was a certain way, and that's a framework that you can use to understand the Buddha any other time. Just like us, it was just experience itself with appearances of an individual that are changing very rapidly. Uh, one of the things that like uh, if you get deeper into Buddhist practice, you'll start to see is that your field of consciousness is made up of tons and tons of different sensations that are very transient. Uh, this ties into the anicca part of uh, Buddhism, which is also the impermanence. The anicca is this, uh, the Pali term for it. But the, the whole idea is that the, the Buddha is not this being or even this person that you've heard of. That's a lot of what this sutra is going to cover is things like that. And with this first idea where he's saying the Buddha is going to bring all of these beings to, you know, Nibbana, Nirvana, however you want to say it, liberation. In the end, it also says, you know, but in truth, none will really be brought there. And what it's saying is that all of these beings that we might speak of in a relative sense of being liberated Yes, it will happen in a sense, but also it, it can't happen because that is to to act as if the beings were real concrete things that weren't just kind of evaporating out of existence split second by split second on the level of perception. Uh, I don't know uh, how well uh, that explanation kind of works to kind of get toward what you were asking. But, uh, yeah, I, I was. I guess I'm wondering if these beings are like within the psyche, or are they uh, referring to like everything in the external world, like we can see, like animals and actual physical beings? Well, I think they're they are referring to you know actual physical beings with when they say that, but there's also a bit of an issue that comes up with that question that. In, in a lot of these non-dual schools of philosophy, like Hinduism or Buddhism, uh, they, or Taoism, there isn't really a separation that like a Western mind in the modern world would normally make. There's not as much of a separation between like a psychological being and a physical being. All of them happen within experience itself, and that's just the ground for everything you might say is just experience and it could be really there is no physical being without some type of psychological process taking uh, or going on at the same time, at least from a first person subjective sense, which is what a lot of the Eastern spiritual teachings are focused around is your own experience that's occurring now, what's actual, what's real in front of you. 
Um, and all of that is a mixture of both mind and or, or psychological processes and uh, the physical. It, it's kind of one thing. The physical and the mental are, are combined. It all occurs within consciousness, you might say, but um, that's where the physical takes place. But there's no consciousness in a sense without the physical, although some of the more advanced Buddhist uh, like states and, and Hindu states of like meditation kind of break that notion down because you get to places where there isn't even a physical body uh, or objects. There's just kind of awareness empty. Um, so are, are these sutras, I mean, it, is, it does not sound like they actually come from the Buddha, but someone who, like who, who wrote this? Now this this is you know this is something that would get into like a Buddhist kind of historical debate of you know th with the Diamond Sutra specifically it came later on so it could have been that it was recorded and then or it was a spoken you know teaching for many many years and then it was finally written down we don't know. It's kind of like seeing a, a Christian teaching that came, but it, its first like manifestation that we know of came in like 300 AD or something like that. It might be linked to Christ, like that thing, or this might be linked to the Buddha's original teachings, but it isn't completely like it's not well agreed upon whether this really was spoken by the Buddha or not. But either way, it's one of the foundational sutras for uh, Mahayana Buddhism, which is focused on a lot of uh, commentarial like teachings as well. So uh, Theravada Buddhism is what focuses on the things that came like the very earliest of the suttas. Uh, and uh, if you hear me changing between the word sutra and sutta, that's just because like the Diamond Sutra, most like people who use Mahayana or who are in Mahayana Buddhism will use that Sanskrit for the word. Um, and Sutta is what a lot of the Theravada Buddhist people will use because uh, they're focused on when Buddhism started and like the most basic texts that were around then that they that it's most certain were actually from the Buddha. People say the Theravadan texts are the ones that you know we know with the highest probability were actually linked to things that he directly said okay so should we continue playing uh yeah unless you have anything else Uti. in the practice of compassion and charity a disciple should be detached that is to say he should practice compassion and charity without regard to appearances without regard to form without regard to sound smell taste touch or any quality of any kind Subhuti, this is how the disciple should practice compassion and charity. Why? Because practicing compassion and charity without attachment is the way to reaching the highest perfect wisdom. It is the way to becoming a living Buddha. So he basically equals uh, detachment with compassion. It's like they are basically basically the same thing. Kind of. It's uh, the way I interpret this is it's like be compassionate, but not um, for an egoic reason that it's good to be compassionate. It's it's a bit paradoxical, uh, like pretty much this whole sutra is is filled with a bunch of paradoxes. Uh, yeah, but, but you, do, you do need to be detached if you are going to be mm -hmm. not be an ego, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. So the point is that you wouldn't be doing compassionate acts for your own benefit or even necessarily for the benefit of others, but more for the sake of compassion itself. Subhuti, do you think that you can measure all of the space in the eastern heavens? No, most honored one. One cannot possibly measure all of the space in the eastern heavens. Subhuti, can space in all the western, southern and northern heavens, both above and below, be measured? No, most honored one. One cannot possibly measure all the space in the western, southern and northern heavens. Well, Subhuti, the same is true of the merit of the disciple who practices compassion and charity without any attachment to appearances, without cherishing any idea of form. It is impossible to measure the merit they will accrue. Subhuti, 
my disciples should let their minds absorb and dwell in the teachings I have just given. Chapter 5. Subhuti, what do you think? Can the Buddha be recognized by means of his bodily form? No, most honored one. The Buddha cannot be recognized by means of his bodily form. Why? Because when the Buddha speaks of bodily form, it is not a real form, but only an illusion. The Buddha then spoke to Subhuti. All that has a form is elusive and unreal. When you see that all forms are elusive and unreal, then you will begin to perceive your true Buddha nature. So, I mean, they're, they're talking as if they are not recognizing, they are like talking to Buddha, not in physical form here. Is that... No, no, no. The, the, the story is set as, as if uh, Sabuti, a monk, is coming to the physical, like, living, breathing Buddha 2,600 years ago. He's coming to him and having a conversation with him. Pretty much, I think, actually, all of the sutras, suttas, however you want to say it, uh, are a, a conversation between a real conversation, supposedly. That's the idea. A real conversation that occurred between the Buddha and one of his disciples or someone he was teaching or in some way uh, the teaching, you know, went between the two and that's why it was written down. Okay. Because it says you cannot recognize the Buddha by his bodily form. That mm -hmm. implies that uh, the essence of Buddha is... Uh, of course, within this person, it speaks. It's like the definition of Buddha is not actually the person. Yeah, in, in a sense, it, that is true. It, I mean, if like I, if we got like some very advanced like Buddhist monks or masters or whatever together, and they had a conversation about what the Buddha is, that could last a very long time. Uh, it's not a simple, like, cut and dry, like another, uh, you know, religion or philosophical system like the person. The Buddha is also, I mean, at least in the lens of the Diamond Sutra, is also viewed as, in a sense, kind of similar to the teaching itself. Um, in that, it, it even says later in the Sutra that even any, any Dharma or Dhamma is empty, and there, you can apply the same kind of thinking to the idea of who is the Buddha. Well, the Buddha isn't here right now in our field of experience for you and me. Uh, I don't see a Buddha as far as, you know, an Asian guy from 2,600 years ago sitting in front of me telling me about enlightenment. That's not here. That's not, you know, real or apparent in the moment. The idea is uh, the Buddha's teachings and stuff are based upon processes that are going to be universal, that are going to occur, whether it's in a human form, alien form, no, f no physical form. Uh, these are sort of transcendent things. So when we get into talking about who the Buddha is, considering the teachings that he gave were <laughs> so multifaceted and dealt with so many paradoxes and stuff, it's not simple. It's you can't really just give a straightforward answer of who the Buddha is if you're talking about him in that context, in the context of the teachings. Chapter six. Subhuti respectfully asked the Lord Buddha, Most honored one, in the future, if a person hears this teaching, even if it is only a phrase or sentence, is it possible for that person to have a true faith and knowledge of enlightenment awaken in their mind? Without a doubt, Subhuti. Even 500 years after the enlightenment of this Buddha, there will be some who are virtuous and wise, and while practicing compassion and charity, will believe in the words and phrases of this sutra, and will awaken their minds purely. After they come to hear these teachings, they will be inspired with belief. This is because when some people hear these words, they will have understood intuitively that these words are the truth. But you must also remember, Subhuti, that such persons have long ago planted the seeds of goodness and merit that lead to this realization. They have planted the seeds of good deeds and charity, not simply before one Buddhist temple or two temples or five, but before hundreds of thousands of Buddhas and temples. So when a person who hears the words and phrases of this sutra is ready for it to happen, a pure faith and clarity can awaken within their minds. Subhuti, any person who awakens faith upon hearing the words or phrases of this sutra will accumulate countless blessings and merit. How do I know this? 
because this person must have discarded all arbitrary notions of the existence of a personal self, of other people, or of a universal self. Otherwise, their minds would still grasp after such relative conceptions. Furthermore, these people must have already discarded all arbitrary notions of the non-existence of a personal self, other people, or a universal self. Otherwise, their minds would still be grasping at such notions. Therefore, anyone who seeks total enlightenment should discard not only all conceptions of their own selfhood, of other selves, or of a universal self, but they should also discard all notions of the non-existence of such concepts. When the Buddha explains these things using such concepts and ideas, people should remember the unreality of all such concepts and ideas. They should recall that in teaching spiritual truths, the Buddha always uses these concepts and ideas in the way that a raft is used to cross a river. Once the river has been crossed over, the raft is of no more use and should be discarded. These arbitrary concepts and ideas about spiritual things need to be explained to us as we seek to attain enlightenment. However, ultimately, these arbitrary conceptions can be discarded. Think, Subhuti, isn't it even more obvious that we should also give up our conceptions of non-existent things? Chapter 7 Then Buddha asked Subhuti, What do you think, Subhuti? Has the Buddha arrived at the highest, most fulfilled, most awakened and enlightened mind? Does the Buddha teach any teaching? Subhuti replied, As far as I have understood the Lord Buddha's teachings, there is no independently existing object of mind, called the highest, most fulfilled, awakened or enlightened mind. Nor is there any independently existing teacher that the Buddha teaches. Why? Because the teachings that the Buddha has realized and spoken of cannot be conceived as separate, independent things, and therefore cannot be described. The truth in them is uncontainable and inexpressible. It neither is, nor is it not. What does this mean? What this means is that Buddhas and disciples are not enlightened by a set method of teachings, but by an internally intuitive process, which is spontaneous and is part of their own inner nature. Chapter 8 Let me ask you, Subhuti, if a person filled over 10,000 galaxies with the seven treasures for the purpose of compassion, charity, and giving alms, would this person not gain great merit and spread much happiness? Yes, most honoured one, this person would gain great merit and spread much happiness, even though, in truth, this person does not have a separate existence to which merit could accrue. Why? Because this person's merit is characterised with the quality of not being merit. The Buddha continued, then suppose another person understood only four lines of this sutra, but nevertheless took it upon themselves to explain these lines to someone else. This person's merit would be even greater than the other person's. Why? Because all Buddhas and all the teachings and values of the highest, most fulfilled, most awakened minds arise from the teachings in this sutra. And yet, even as I speak, Subhuti, I must take back my words as soon as they are uttered, for there are no Buddhas and there are no teachings. Chapter 9. Buddha then asked, What do you think, Subhuti? Does one who has entered the stream which flows to enlightenment say, I have entered the stream? No, Buddha, Subhuti replied. A true disciple entering the stream would not think of themselves as a separate person that could be entering anything. Only that disciple who does not differentiate themselves from others, who has no regard for name, shape, sound, odour, taste, touch, or for any quality, can truly be called a disciple who has entered the stream. Buddha continued, Does a disciple who is subject to only one more rebirth say to himself, I am entitled to the honours and rewards of a once-to-be-reborn? No, Lord, once-to-be-reborn is only a name. There is no passing away or coming into existence. Only one who realises this can really be called a disciple. Subhuti, does a venerable one who will never more be reborn as a mortal say to himself, I am entitled to the honour and rewards of a non-returner? No, perfectly enlightened one. A non-returner is merely a name. There is actually no one returning and no one not returning. Tell me, Subhuti, does a Buddha say to himself, I have obtained perfect enlightenment? No, Lord, there is no such thing as perfect enlightenment to obtain. If a perfectly enlightened Buddha were to say to himself, I am enlightened, he would be admitting that he is an individual person, a separate self and personality, and would therefore not be a perfectly enlightened Buddha. Subhuti then said, Most honoured one, you have said that I, Subhuti, excel amongst thy disciples in knowing the bliss of enlightenment, in being perfectly content in seclusion, and in being free from all passions. Yet I do not say to myself that I am so, 
for if I ever thought of myself as such, then it would not be true that I had escaped ego delusion. I know that in truth there is no Subhuti, and therefore Subhuti abides nowhere, that he neither knows nor does he not know bliss, and that he is neither free nor enslaved by his passions. Chapter 10 The Buddha then continued, What do you think, Subhuti? When I was in a previous life with Dipankara Buddha, did I receive any definite teaching or attain any degree of self-control, whereby I later became a Buddha? No, Honourable One. When you were a disciple of Dipankara Buddha, in truth, you received no definite teaching, nor did you attain any definite degree of self-control. Subhuti, know also that if any Buddha would say, I will create a paradise, he would speak falsely. Why? Because a paradise cannot be created, nor can it not be uncreated. A disciple should develop a mind which is in no way dependent upon sights, sounds, smells, tastes, sensory sensations, or any mental conceptions. A disciple should develop a mind which does not rely on anything. Therefore, Subhuti, the minds of all disciples should be purified of all thoughts that relate to seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching and discriminating. They should use their minds spontaneously and naturally, without being constrained by preconceived notions arising from the senses. Suppose, Subhuti, a man had an enormous body. Would the sense of personal existence he had also be enormous? Yes, indeed, Buddha, Subhuti answered. His sense of personal existence would be enormous. But the Buddha has taught that personal existence is just a name, for it is, in fact, neither existence nor non-existence. So it only has the name, personal existence. Chapter 11 Subhuti, if there were as many Ganges rivers as the number of grains of sand in the Ganges, would you say that the number of grains of sand in all those Ganges rivers would be very many? Subhuti answered, very many indeed, most honoured one. If the number of Ganges rivers were that large, how much more so would be the number of grains of sand in all those Ganges rivers? Subhuti, I will declare a truth to you. If a good man or good woman filled over 10,000 galaxies of worlds with the seven treasures for each grain of sand in all those Ganges rivers and gave it all away for the purpose of compassion, charity and giving alms, would this man or woman not gain great merit and spread much happiness? Subhuti replied, very much so, most honoured one. Subhuti, if after studying and observing even a single stanza of this sutra, another person were to explain it to others, the happiness and merit that would result from this virtuous act would be far greater. Chapter 12. Furthermore, Subhuti, if any person in any place were to teach even four lines of this sutra, the place where they taught it would become sacred ground and would be revered by all kinds of beings. How much more sacred would the place become if that person then studied and observed the whole sutra? Subhuti, you should know that any person who does that would surely attain something rare and profound. Wherever this sutra is honoured and revered, there is a sacred site enshrining the presence of the Buddha or one of the Buddha's most venerable disciples. Subhuti said to the Buddha, by what name shall we know this sutra? so that it can be honoured and studied. The Lord Buddha replied, this sutra shall be known as the diamond that cuts through illusion. By this name it shall be revered and studied and observed. What does this name mean? It means that when the Buddha named it, he did not have in mind any definite or arbitrary conception and so named it. This sutra is hard and sharp, like a diamond that will cut away all arbitrary conceptions and bring one to the other shore of enlightenment. What do you think, uh, Andreas? Do you Has want the to pause taught it? any definite teaching in this sutra? No, Lord. Uh, okay, and I think you were muted for a minute. I just want to make sure you're not now. Um, is there anything that's that you thought was interesting about that stretch there? I mean, we went a pretty decent bit without any commentary. So yeah, I mean, it's difficult to. I feel like in order to really be able to comment, you would need more of the context. So it's like I'm waiting to like hear more and more of it. Okay. Um, well, if you don't have anything in mind, then yeah, I guess we can just keep going. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything that had come up that we didn't cover. Yeah. I mean, okay, who, who is Subhuti exactly? 
Okay, so Bhuti is just a monk who's practiced under the Buddha and was one of his like best disciples, like most skilled in understanding the the spiritual insights and and getting to the states of consciousness that the Buddha might be talking about uh, in various other teachings that the Buddha gives. Uh, he's essentially just a really good student of the Buddha. And he's just asking him questions uh, for the sake of his own awakening. The Buddha has not taught any definite teaching in this sutra. What do you think, Subhuti? Are there many particles of dust in this vast universe? Subhuti replied, yes, many, most honored one. Subhuti, when the Buddha speaks of particles of dust, it does not mean I am thinking of any definite or arbitrary thought. I am merely using these words as a figure of speech. They are not real, only illusion. It is just the same with the word universe. These words do not assert any definite or arbitrary idea. I am only using the words as words. Subhuti, what do you think? Can the Buddha be perceived by means of his 32 physical characteristics? No, most honored one. The Buddha cannot be perceived by his 32 physical characteristics. Why? Because the Buddha teaches that they are not real, but are merely called the 32 physical characteristics. Subhuti, if a good and faithful person, whether male or female, has for the sake of compassion and charity been sacrificing their life for generation upon generation, for as many generation as the grains of sand in 3,000 universes, and another follower has been studying and observing even a single section of this sutra and explains it to others, that person's blessings and merit would be far greater. Chapter 14. At that time, after listening to this sutra, Subhuti had understood its profound meaning and was moved to tears. He said, what a rare and precious thing it is that you should deliver such a deeply profound teaching. Since the day I attained the eyes of understanding, thanks to the guidance of the Buddha, I have never before heard teachings so deep and wonderful as these. Most honored one, if someone hears this sutra and has pure and clear confidence in it, they will have a profound insight into the truth. Having perceived that profound insight, that person will realize the rarest kind of virtue. Most honored one, that insight into the truth is essentially not insight into the truth, but is what the Buddha calls insight into the truth. Most honored one, having listened to this sutra, I am able to receive and retain it with faith and understanding. This is not difficult for me, but in ages to come, in the last 500 years, if there is a person who hears this sutra, who receives and retains it with faith and understanding, then that person will be a rare one, a person of most remarkable achievement. Such a person will be able to awaken pure faith because they have ceased to cherish any arbitrary notions of their own selfhood, other selves, living beings, or a universal self. Why? because if they continue to hold onto arbitrary conceptions as to their own selfhood, they will be holding onto something that is non-existent. It is the same with all arbitrary conceptions of other selves, living beings, or a universal self. These are all expressions of non-existent things. Buddhas are Buddhas because they have been able to discard all arbitrary conceptions of form and phenomena. They have transcended all perceptions and have penetrated the illusion of all forms. So my question here is like, are they, are they merely trying to say that like nothing exists or is there something that exists that people are not aware of? Is, is, there, are they, is there any kind of discernment here or is it all like just... So um, one thing that uh, Mahayana Buddhism as well as like this sutra deals with a lot is uh, the, it's a type of logic known as the tetralemma. And uh, I, I forget the name of the, the monk who came up with it. But uh, as you've heard, like in parts of this, it'll say like something kind of exists and doesn't exist. Uh, if we think of the tetralemma, it's basically, okay, you could say the self exists is one statement that could be made. And then you could say the self doesn't exist. That's another st statement that could be made. The second, or I mean, the third and fourth parts of the tetralemma, this type of logic, are okay. The self is something that's more transcendent than either existing or not existing. It's not just one or the other; it's both. That would be like the third option. 
And a fourth option, which you've heard the language used a few times in this sutra already, is that something neither exists nor does not exist. And uh, this can be uh, like the first time like you stumble upon this type of logic, especially like with a Western mind. Like for me, it was really puzzling and interesting to me at the same time, but uh, it deals a lot with paradox. Kind of the point of the tetra lemma and that logic is to pinpoint the fact that there isn't something that is concrete that's still here that we can discuss. Uh, maybe you could say this, what they're pointing to is more the process that's unfolding of experience right now. But like, does my cat exist? You could say yes, but what cat are we talking about? Are we talking about the bundle of sensations that was there a second ago that's no longer here? Are we talking about the bundle of sensations that's here in this moment but is going to be gone in another split second? Uh, it, it deals with a lot of these ideas like when you apply impermanence and uh, no self, these insights to experience at a deep level, it unravels a lot of the conceptual understanding to where, if as you heard the Buddha say, I'm using these things as just words. What he's kind of meaning by this is that the concepts themselves, the words will bring up an image of something, like he says, the Ganges River. When that image comes up in your mind, it isn't actually the Ganges River, and that image in your mind is even changing moment to moment. So there's an appearance within your mind of what the Ganges River is, but it's not the actual Ganges River. And even if you went to the actual Ganges River and it was there in front of you, it would be changing moment to moment. There isn't a concrete, like, uh, I forget which one of the Greek philosophers used it, but um, he had this idea of like, a sort of form or idea or concept that was like this concrete thing separate from what was experienced. Um, this would be a kind of version where there's not even some idea of something that is concrete or that actually matters or applies in all situations. We're using these words and even these mental images attached to these words for the sake of a relative conversation of of things. But what this whole teaching is about is that the relative uh, domain of understanding itself isn't sufficient to explain experience. And that's why all of these paradoxical forms of logic are getting thrown in partially just to show the mind that it cannot grasp these things in the concrete way that uh, we typically think of them, that they're actually more transcendent uh, and more elusive than we often would think, especially when uh, functioning in a practical level. Yeah, so I imagine it's like, it, it reminds me a bit of what uh, uh, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said about uh, uh, you can't step in the same rim river twice. Mm. Because, yeah, um, so yeah, I, I mean, that makes sense to me that th there, there is something, but it's like, yeah, process like a river, like fireworks constantly shooting up mm -hmm. uh, everywhere, like, you, yeah, whether it be the physical or the mental, everything is basically motion. That's how I yes. think yeah. of reality in what I try to teach. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a very good way of putting it, and it lines up a lot with what these this teaching in specific is trying to get at, is that when we refer to things as like nouns, they're really always more like a verb or a process, uh, and even then, like as the the process of us discussing these things is unfolding, it's never something you can latch onto as as something that's that's real and there, because even if you want to say that like physical object is real and there in a moment you know as as you already kind of described it's it's changing perception itself is changing even if like let's say the physical let's make this a bit more like materialist and reductionist 
let's say there's just a box in front of us that we both can see the box itself might not change in a scientific way. Like, uh, even though I feel like if you go deep enough into, you know, like quantum mechanics or even string theory or other, uh, things like science is even going to show that there's really not the same continuity that we would initially give to an object when we see it. But, uh, when we think about it, adding in the layer of perception on top of that, that it's, we're perceiving this box in front of us, the the little tiny sensate particles that make up that box are changing and if someone has enough mindfulness or sati as it is in poly you can even see um you, the visual particles changing and dancing it takes a certain level of attention and awareness to uh, fully tap into that kind of stuff but uh, it, it does start to unravel the idea of there really being anything concrete that we're dealing with. And it's more this elusive process unfolding itself, uh, especially when you apply like the no self insight into things. Um, that's where it, it's, it, it reminds me a lot of Taoism, uh, Taoism, uh, you, it, it's sort of like the Tao is just playing itself out and there might there often is a character with a certain personality and storyline attached to it in the center so to speak uh like it's experiencing this as an individual being but really it's just experience itself playing itself out um and the character that would see itself as being in control of itself is just one process occurring within that field of experience. Okay. Well, let's uh, continue then with this in mind. Okay. The Buddha replied, so it is Sabuti. Most wonderfully blessed will be those beings who on hearing this sutra will not tremble nor be frightened or terrified in any way. And why? The Buddha has taught this sutra as the highest perfection and what the Buddha teaches as the highest perfection that also the innumerable blessed Buddhas do teach. Therefore, it is called the highest perfection. Subhuti, when I talk about the practice of transcendent patience. I... So when he's talking about perfection after hearing this, is it like the perfect, the perfection itself is an understanding? Because he's not talking about any type of action beyond that. Yeah, I think uh, the way you said it makes some sense to me. I mean, I wasn't, um, I I'm not sure exactly what sense they, they mean the perfection, like on this specific point. So I would just kind of go with whatever, uh, you're, whatever you're feeling intuitively, how, however it's making sense. Um, and I'd say we can just kind of move on and maybe it, it, they'll provide some context in a moment that will kind of clarify that to some degree. Do not hold on to any arbitrary conceptions about the phenomena of patience. I merely refer to it as the practice of transcendent patience. And why is that? Because when, thousands of lifetimes ago, the Prince of Kalinga severed the flesh from my limbs and my body, I had no perception of a self, a being, a soul, or a universal self. If I had cherished any of these arbitrary notions at the time my limbs were being torn away, I would have fallen into anger and hatred. I also remember Subuti. Okay, I, I got a bit confused there. I mean, he's, he's talking about some, something that sounds kind of mythological. Or like... Yeah, it is. And this is one of the criticisms I do have of, of Buddhism. And I think this comes a lot from uh, Buddhism, like the element of it where it functions more as a religion. Uh, so, like, the Buddha's talking about a past life that he had. But if you really apply the teachings that are in like this sutra, for example, it should show anyone who understands it to any degree that a past life is just a concept in your own mind occurring now. Um, I think he's using it. Uh, I mean, let, let's just assume that the Buddha did have some like memory or experiential thing where he saw that his limbs were getting torn apart like a thousand years ago in some context and it had some spiritual meaning or significance to it like it, it was just a mental uh phenomena occurring to him in his current life like 2600 years ago 
you know, at that time, it would have just been a memory or some type of mental construct of that happening rather than something actual like in the moment. So um, it, that's one thing I'm not a huge fan of is when they bring in all of this past life stuff. Because I think if you really get to the core of what the Eastern spiritual teachings are about, you realize that uh, there, there isn't some past moment which, in which some real event occurred that's going to affect the karma of now. It's more just what's here right now is playing itself out based on the conditions that are here and now. Um, but as a little wrinkle, uh, as part of that, any memories of something that either was or wasn't real are occurring now and they are affecting the the cause and effect relationship of what's unfolding so it's a so little was this, so this spiritual, uh, I, I can't remember exactly what they said there but uh, basically the spiritual significance was happening then uh, uh, at the moment he recalled this and not at the moment he it was not like he was able to be so detached that he didn't care that his limbs were torn off. In a well, past. that's that's kind of what he's claiming is that he was so detached and in such a, you know, quote unquote, enlightened or awakened state or like no self state that at the moment his limbs were being ripped off in this like past life or memory or just mental uh, you know, sort of story that came up in his experience that he thought was real from the past. He had the experience of being so detached from his sense of self that there was no sense of self there to resist such a thing. And that's why anger didn't arise when or like, you know, other negative feelings didn't arise when that was happening. There was still probably the the physical sensations of pain of the arm is being ripped off, but there wasn't a personality that was claiming the arms as itself. So therefore there wasn't anger arising in that situation. That during my 500 previous lives, I had used life after life to practice patience and to look upon my life humbly as though I were a saint called upon to suffer humility. Even then my mind was free of arbitrary conceptions of the phenomena of myself, a being, a soul, or a universal self. Therefore, Sabuti, disciples should leave behind all distinctions of phenomena and awaken the thought of the attainment of supreme enlightenment. A disciple should do this by not allowing their mind to depend upon ideas evoked by the world of the senses, by not allowing their mind to depend upon ideas stirred by sounds, odors, flavors, sensory touch, or any other qualities. The disciple's mind should be kept independent of any thought that might arise within it. If the disciple's mind depends upon anything in the sensory realm, it will have no solid foundation in any reality. This is why Buddha teaches that the mind of a disciple should not accept the appearances of things as a basis when exercising charity. Subhuti, as disciples practice compassion and charity for the welfare of all living beings, they should do it without relying on appearances and without attachment. Just as the Buddha declares that form is not form, so he also declares that all living beings are, in fact, not living beings. Chapter 15. Subhuti, if on the one hand a son or daughter of a good family gives up his or her life in the morning, as many times as there are grains of sand in the Ganges River as an act of generosity, and gives as many again in the afternoon and as many again in the evening, and continues doing so for countless ages, and if on the other hand another person listens to this sutra with complete confidence and without contention, that person's happiness will be far greater. But the happiness of one who writes this sutra down, receives, recites, and explains it to others, cannot even be compared, it is so great. Subhuti, we can summarize by saying that the merit and virtue of this sutra is inconceivable, incalculable, and boundless. The Buddha has declared this teaching for the benefit of initiates on the path to enlightenment. He has declared it for the benefit of initiates on the path to nirvana. If there is someone capable of receiving, practicing, reciting, and sharing this sutra with others, the Buddha will see and know that person, and he or she will receive immeasurable, incalculable, and boundless merit and virtue. Such a person is known to be carrying the supreme enlightenment attained by the Buddha. Why? Subhuti, if a person is satisfied with lesser teachings than those I present here, if he or she is still caught up in the idea of a self 
a person, a living being, or a universal self, then that person would not be able to listen to, receive, recite, or explain this sutra to others. Sabuti, wherever this sutra shall be observed, studied, and explained, that place will become sacred ground, to which countless spiritually advanced beings will bring offerings. So, what I'm wondering here is like, is the sutra something that exists? Because if nothing mm -hmm. exists, I mean, it should be a process as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's that's the thing is, you know, the the, the teaching of the sutra isn't to say that that nothing exists because that would be too a, a too simplified way of trying to conceive of it to actually explain what's going on. It's kind of like what the sutra is about is that just saying that like the self doesn't exist at the beginning maybe like five or ten minutes in he says something about that like in relation to a sense of self he says even to throw away the idea that like it's very common in buddhism you say okay there's no self he says also you're going to need to throw away that idea of no self because that isn't accurate either and it's not that there's self or no self, and those are the two options. It's that there's something more transcendent and really slippery to grasp onto that is an insight into the nature of reality. Uh, and, and that's like what the sutta is about. It's about discovering that elusive nature of what's happening. And it can't really be described well in, in words, uh, that's kind of the point of it too. That's kind of the point of the tetra lemma logic from my pr uh, point of understanding it is that a lot of it is geared towards getting you to realize that your mind is incapable of grasping the nature in some intellectual way or simplified way. It's never going to be uh, sufficient enough to, to really understand. Uh, it's more uh, in the direct experience of what's happening right now. The closer and more intimate you can seem to get to that, um, that's where these answers are held, not in the words or the logic or any of that. Yeah, it's interesting that he also mentions that there is no universal self, which mm -hmm. sounds like a criticism of, uh, I guess, I mean, it sounds like a criticism of modern New Age uh, teachings. But I mean, and also it's it's even more directly a criticism of Hinduism. So yeah, okay. Hinduism was much focused on the Atman and the Brahman, both essentially two sides of the coin of a universal undying soul like self. Um, and I think the the highest level Hindus probably got beyond that way of seeing things and were seeing similar to what the Buddha was talking about. But uh, you can think of Buddhism and the Buddha is kind of similar to Jesus and Judaism. Like the Buddha is to Hinduism what Jesus is to Judaism. He was supposedly like brought up in the Jewish tradition or the Buddha would have been practicing in a sort of Hindu context, like being in India at that time. That's the spiritual system he would have been operating in. But eventually the same as like Jesus had differences and criticisms of how Judaism was being practiced at the time. The Buddha had that toward Hinduism. And that was that's one a statement that really clearly shows that is that he was against the idea that there's some eternal self. It's he's saying more. No, there, there's not even that like that's a good step to like get closer to the answer, but the Buddha is saying, no, there's something even more elusive to, to the nature of reality that, that even explaining it as the Atman or the Brahman isn't going to cut it. If you want to get the deepest understanding. Yeah. Because even if there was something like that, that would be changing as well. So it's also exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Such places, however humble they may be, will be revered as though they were famous temples, and countless pilgrims will come there to worship. Such a place is a shrine and should be venerated with formal ceremonies and offerings of flowers and incense. That is the power of this sutra. Chapter 16. Furthermore, Subhuti, 
if a good man or woman who accepts, upholds, reads or recites this sutra is disdained or slandered, if they are despised or insulted, it means that in prior lives they committed evil acts and as a result are now suffering the fruits of their actions. When their prior life's evil acts have finally been dissolved and extinguished, he or she will attain the supreme clarity of a most fulfilled and awakened mind. Subhuti, in ancient times before I met Dipankara Buddha, I had made offerings to and had been attendant of all 84,000 million Buddhas. If someone is able to receive, recite, study and practice this sutra in a later, more distant age, then the happiness and merit brought about by this virtuous act would be hundreds of thousands of times greater than that which I brought about by my service to the Buddhas in ancient times. In fact, such happiness and merit cannot be conceived or compared with anything, even mathematically. If I were to explain all of this in detail now, some people might become suspicious and disbelieving, and their minds may even become disoriented or confused. Subhuti, you should know that the meaning of this sutra is beyond conception and discussion. Likewise, the fruit resulting from receiving and practicing this sutra is beyond conception and discussion. Chapter 17. At that time, the Venerable Subhuti then asked the Buddha, World Honoured One, may I ask you a question again? If sons or daughters of a good family want to develop the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind, if they wish to attain the highest perfect wisdom, what should they do to help quiet their drifting minds and master their thinking? The Buddha replied, Subhuti, a good son or daughter who wants to give rise to the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind must create this resolved attitude of mind. I must help to lead all beings to the shore of awakening. But after these beings have become liberated, in truth, I know that not even a single being has been liberated. Why is this so? If a disciple cherishes the idea of a self, a person, a living being or a universal self, then that person is not an authentic disciple. Why? Because in fact, there is no independently existing object of mind called the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind. What do you think, Subhuti? In ancient times, when the Buddha was living with Dipankara Buddha, did he attain anything called the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind? No, most honoured one. According to what I understand from the teachings of the Buddha, there is no attaining of anything called the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind. The Buddha said, you are correct, Subhuti. In fact, there does not exist any so-called highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind that the Buddha attains. Because if there had been any such thing, Dipankara Buddha would not have predicted of me. In the future, you will come to be a Buddha known as the most honoured one. This prediction was made because there is, in fact, nothing to be attained. Someone if you want would be mistaken pause to say here, that the Buddha has attained the add. highest, most fulfilled and... So, um, while I was, uh, I was watching the uh, discussion you guys had of the UG Krishnamurti um, video, and, and I, I only got kind of early into it, but... There was one part that I, I figured I would comment on when we talked, uh, and that was where he said he, he realized that there really was no such thing as enlightenment. That's what the Buddha is describing right now is I, I actually had that insight while I was listening to uh, this sutra uh, maybe like a year and a half ago. For the first time, that insight like hit me and made sense. And I realized its significance. So when you realize that there's no such thing as enlightenment, you realize that this whole chase of enlightenment was really for nothing because you realize that there was nothing there to grasp in the first place. And when that insight hits in the correct way, you'll realize that what there really is, what experience is, already had this sort of non-enlightenment and enlightenment thing like built into it it's really just pointing back to life itself as it is that's kind of what enlightenment is it's like a wild goose chase into nothing at all and you realize uh, it, one part that it's going to say later on is um that like the the dharma or the dhamma basically the teachings that are that are given by the Buddha and happen in Buddhism are empty. And it's the same kind of thing as saying that enlightenment isn't there. When enlightenment doesn't exist, there's just what remains is what is as it's always sort of been, just experience unfolding. 
And when the quote unquote individual like person ego structure is exposed to that in the right way, that's when a lot of those systems that that line up with the ego and bring about a strong sense of self that creates all the reactions and such that come out of a sense of self like that's when a lot of that can start to fall away is when that insight is is really seen uh at, at a, a level that you know starts to make a difference okay yeah i mean when it comes to enlightenment i feel that yeah i mean it it depends on how you define it of But course it And it makes sense that it, it 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 doesn't work as a kind of permanent state, and that's why it sounds like when they bring up that the person who who um, who recites this or understands this is like it's like the understanding itself. For example, the, the understanding that there is no enlightenment could be said to be enlightenment mm -hmm. because because. Hey. Krishnamurti also said that he realized that he was enlightenment, that uh, that he was enlightened. Uh, so there was the, that contradiction uh, mm -hmm. that we commented on as well. Yeah, so that was just a parallel between that content that, that you made and this I figured I'd bring up, but uh, we can keep playing it. Or I, how, how are you doing for Wake time? Because I know, I know this is probably already... Yeah, we're already probably a bit over like the hour you and I kind of had planned. Do you want to continue or what are your thoughts? We can that? continue for a little bit more. Uh, I'm I'm fine with that too then. Because there is no such thing as a highest, most fulfilled or awakened mind to be attained. Subuti, a comparison can be made with the idea of a large human body. What would you understand me to mean if I spoke of a large human body? I would understand that the Lord Buddha was speaking of a large human body, not as an arbitrary conception of its being, but as a series of words only. I would understand that the words carried merely an imaginary meaning. When the Buddha speaks of a large human body, he uses the words only as words. Subhuti, it is just the same when a disciple speaks of liberating numberless sentient beings. If they have in mind any arbitrary conception of sentient beings or of definite numbers, then they are unworthy of being called a disciple. Subhuti, my teachings reveal that even such a thing as is called a disciple is non-existent. Furthermore, there is really nothing for a disciple to live. A true disciple knows that there is no such thing as self, a person, a living being, or a universal self. A true disciple knows that all things are devoid of selfhood, devoid of any separate individuality. To make this teaching even more emphatic, the Lord Buddha continued. If a disciple were to speak as followed, I have to create a serene and beautiful Buddha field. That person is not yet truly a disciple. Why? What the Buddha calls a serene and beautiful Buddha field is not in fact a serene and beautiful Buddha field. And that is why it is called a serene and beautiful Buddha field. Subhuti, only a disciple who is wholly devoid of any conception of separate selfhood is worthy of being called a disciple. Chapter 18. The Buddha then asked Subhuti, What do you think? Does the Buddha have human eyes? Subhuti replied, Yes, he has human eyes. Does he have the eyes of enlightenment? Of course, the Buddha has the eyes of enlightenment, otherwise he would not be the Buddha. Does the Buddha have the eyes of transcendent intelligence? Yes, the Buddha has the eyes of transcendent intelligence. Does the Buddha have the eyes of spiritual intuition? Yes, Lord, the Buddha has the eyes of spiritual intuition. Does the Buddha have the eyes of love and compassion for all sentient beings? Subhuti agreed and said, Lord, you love all sentient life. What do you think, Subhuti? When I referred to the grains of sand in the river Ganges, did I assert that they were truly grains of sand? No, blessed Lord, you only spoke of them as grains of sand. Subhuti, if there were as many Ganges rivers as there are grains of sand in the river Ganges, and if there were as many Buddha lands, as there are grains of sand in all those innumerable rivers. Would these Buddha lands be considered numerous? Very numerous indeed, Lord Buddha. Subhuti, I know the mind of every sentient being in all the host of universes, regardless of any modes of thought, conceptions or tendencies. For all modes, conceptions and tendencies of thought are not mind, and yet they are called mind. Why? It is impossible to retain a past thought, to seize a future thought, and even to hold on to a present thought. Chapter 19. The Buddha continued. What do you think, Subhuti? If a follower were to give away enough treasures to fill 3,000 universes, would a great blessing and merit occur to him or her? Subhuti replied, Honored one, such a follower would acquire considerable blessings and merit. The Lord Buddha said, Subhuti, if such a blessing had any substantiality, if it were anything other than a figure of speech, the most honored one would not have used the words blessings and merit. Chapter 20 Subhuti, what do you think? Should one look for Buddha in his perfect physical body? 
No, perfectly enlightened one. They are, one they repeat the Buddha a lot. His perfect physical body. Mm -hmm. One. Yeah. The Buddha has said that the perfect physical body is not the perfect physical body. Therefore, it is called the perfect physical body. Sabuti, what do you think? Should one look for Buddha in all his perfect appearances? No, most honored one. One should not look for Buddha in all his perfect appearances. Why? The Buddha has said, perfect appearances are not perfect appearances. Therefore, they are called perfect appearances. Chapter 21. Subhuti, do not maintain that the Buddha has this thought. I have spoken spiritual truths. Do not think that way. Why? If someone says the Buddha has spoken spiritual truths, he slanders the Buddha due to his inability to understand what the Buddha teaches. Subhuti, as to speaking truth, no truth can be spoken. Therefore, it is called speaking truth. At that time, Subhuti, the wise elder, addressed the Buddha. Most honored one, will there be living beings in the future who believe this sutra when they hear it? The Buddha said, the living beings to whom you refer are neither living beings nor not living beings. Why, Subhuti? All the different kinds of living beings the Buddha speaks of are not living beings, but they are referred to as living beings. Chapter 22. Subhuti again asked, Blessed Lord, when you attained complete enlightenment, did you feel in your mind that nothing had been acquired? The Buddha replied, That is it exactly, Subhuti. When I attained total enlightenment, I did not feel, as the mind feels, any arbitrary conception of spiritual truth, not even the slightest. So, I wonder why does he why does he stress that living beings are not living or alive? Uh, I think what that is getting at it, it, it's just another example of that same repetition that he was using, you know, to kind of describe other things like, you know, spiritual truth. It, it, like he was saying, there isn't really spiritual truth, but basic a part that he didn't quite say like verbatim, but this is kind of like a connector to understand it is like, but there's the appearance of something in experience that seems like it's spiritual truth, but that thing is transient and it's changing and it's gone as soon as it arises. And, uh, for that reason, you call it spiritual truth, even though it's not really in, in essence, actually spiritual truth. It's just, some sensations that were there for a split second and gone. Uh, that's kind of one way you can think about these things. It, uh, when he was talking about living beings, he's saying, yes, there, there's uh, right now there's a cat sitting on my lap. Like my cat is actually here. Um, in a sense, it's a living being, but in another sense, you know, it's just a bundle of sensations uh, that I have all of these mental ideas attached to that are telling me that it's a cat, that it's alive, that it's a biological organism. And the point is that there can be an appearance of that thing, but it not actually be that in its quote unquote true nature, like in this spiritual sense of understanding it. Even the words total enlightenment are mere words. They are used merely as a figure of speech. Chapter 23. Furthermore, Sabuti, what I have attained in total enlightenment is the same as what all others have attained. It is undifferentiated, regarded neither as a high state nor a low state. It is wholly independent of any definite or arbitrary conceptions of an individual self, other selves, living beings, or a universal self. Sabuti, when someone is selflessly charitable, they should also practice being ethical by remembering that there is no distinction between oneself and the selfhood of others. Thus, one practices charity by giving not only gifts, but through kindness and sympathy. Practice kindness and charity without attachment, and you can become fully enlightened. Sabuti, what I just said about kindness does not mean that when someone is being charitable, they should hold on to arbitrary conceptions about kindness, for kindness is, after all, only a word, and charity needs to be spontaneous and selfless, done without regard for appearances. Chapter 24. The Buddha continued. Sabuti, if a person collected treasures as high as 3,000 of the highest mountains and gave them all to others, their merit would be less than what would accrue to another person who simply observed and studied this sutra and, out of kindness, explained it to others. The latter person would accumulate hundreds of times the merit, hundreds of thousands of millions of times the merit. There is no conceivable comparison. So it sounds like when it comes to action, like what to do in the world, uh, like uh, it seems that there seems to be like a hierarchy of the uh, the most important or the most charitable is to study this teaching or this sutra 
compared to someone who simply goes around being uh, uh, just with worldly success or something right yeah, like he's okay. saying like gathering treasure he used examples of like people being really compassionate and giving like uh you know assistance or help or items or whatever to a million beings he, he gives examples like that the idea i think with like when he's saying that is really that Anything you do in the world of appearances, the world of experience and ideas of being a human being and, and operating in that way, it's all secondary to the process itself that occurs, that, that, that's occurring, that's sort of like a framework for that. And that's just kind of how experience operates itself what is actually occurring in the moment. If you can see the nature of that and that there isn't an individual that's suffering in the first place, there's just what's occurring of its own accord. If you can see that, he's saying there's going to be merit. I think a lot of it, um, now that I'm listening to it this specific time, it's making sense to me that a lot of the merit that comes when he describes this isn't because like, it's going to be merit where like socially everybody comes and, you know, gives that person praise. I think even when it describes things like that, it's it's a figure of speech like it's said with a lot of this. It's more to say the person, if they're acting in this way or they're acting in a way that aligns with what the sutra talks about, their experience or just not even their experience, but the experience that's occurring is going to be better than the, at least subjectively, it's going to feel better and seem like a better thing than the experience of someone who attains worldly pleasures to a ridiculous degree. I think that's a lot of what like this kind of stuff uh, that he's covering right now is, is kind of meant to mean. Chapter 25, Subhuti. Do not say that the Buddha has the idea, I will lead all sentient beings into Nirvana. Do not think that way, Sabuti. Why? In truth, there is not one single being for the Buddha to lead to enlightenment. If the Buddha were to think that there was, he would be caught in the idea of a self, a person, a living being, or a universal self. Sabuti, what the Buddha calls a self, essentially has no self in the way that ordinary persons think there is a self. Sabuti, the Buddha does not regard anyone as an ordinary person. That is why he can speak of them as ordinary persons. Chapter 26. Then the Buddha inquired of Sabuti, What do you think, Sabuti? Is it possible to recognize the Buddha by the 32 physical marks? Sabuti replied, Yes, most honored one. The Buddha may thus be recognized. Sabuti, if that were true, then Chakravatin, the mythological king who also had the 32 marks, would be called a Buddha. Then Sabuti, realizing his error, said, Most honored one, now I realize that the Buddha cannot be recognized merely by his 32 physical marks of excellence. The Buddha said then, should anyone looking at an image or likeness of the Buddha claim to know the Buddha and worship him, that person would be mistaken, not knowing the true Buddha. Chapter 27. However, Subhuti, if you think that the Buddha realizes the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind and does not need to have all the marks, you are mistaken. Subhuti, do not think in that way. Do not think that when one gives rise to the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind, one needs to see all objects of mind as non-existent, cut off from life. Please do not think in that way. One who gives rise to the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind does not contend that all objects of mind are non-existent and cut off from life. That is not what I say. Chapter 28. The Lord Buddha continued. Subhuti, if someone gives treasures equal to the number of sands on the shores of the Ganges River, and if another, having realized the egolessness of all things, thereby understands selflessness, the latter would be more blessed than the one who practiced external charity. Why? Because great disciples do not see blessings and merit as a private possession, as something to be gained. Sabuti inquired of the Lord Buddha, What do you mean great disciples do not see blessings and merit as a private possession? The Buddha replied, Because those blessings and merit have never been sought after by those great disciples. They do not see them as private possessions, but they see them as the common possession of all beings. Chapter 29 The Buddha said, Sabuti, if any person were to say that the Buddha is now coming or going, or sitting up or lying down, they would not have understood the principle I have been teaching. Why? Because while the expression Buddha means he who has thus come, thus gone, the true Buddha is never coming from anywhere or going anywhere. The name Buddha is merely an expression, a figure of speech. Chapter 30. The Lord Buddha resumed. Subhuti, 
If any good person, either man or woman, were to take 3,000 galaxies and grind them into microscopic powder and blow it into space, what do you think? Would this powder have any individual existence? Sabuti replied, yes, Lord, as a microscopic powder blown into space, it might be said to have a relative existence. But as you use words, it has no existence. The words are used only as a figure of speech. Otherwise, the words would imply a belief in the existence of matter as an independent and self-existent thing, which it is not. Furthermore, when the Most Honoured One refers to the 3,000 galaxies, he could only do so as a figure of speech. Why? Because if the 3,000 galaxies really existed, their only reality would consist in their cosmic unity. Whether as microscopic powder or as galaxies, what does it matter? Only in the sense of the cosmic unity of ultimate being can the Buddha rightfully refer to it. The Lord Buddha was very pleased with this reply and said, Sabuti, although ordinary people have always grasped after an arbitrary conception of matter and galaxies, that concept has no true basis. It is an illusion of the mortal mind. Even when it is referred to as cosmic unity, it is unthinkable and unknowable. Chapter 31. The Lord Buddha continued, If any person were to say that the Buddha in his teachings has constantly referred to himself, to other selves, to living beings, or to a universal self, what do you think? Would that person have understood my meaning? Sabuti replied, No, blessed Lord, that person would not have understood the meaning of your teachings, for when you refer to those things, you are not referring to their actual existence. You only use the words as figures of speech, as symbols. Only in that sense can words be used for conceptions, ideas, limited truths, and spiritual truths have no more reality than have matter or phenomena. Then the Lord Buddha made his meaning even more emphatic by saying, Sabuti, when people begin their practice of seeking to attaining total enlightenment, they ought to see, to perceive, to know, to understand and to realize that all things and all spiritual truths are no things, and therefore they ought not to conceive within their minds any arbitrary conceptions whatsoever. Chapter 32. Buddha continued. Sabuti, if anyone gave to the Buddha an immeasurable quantity of the seven treasures sufficient to fill the whole universe, and if another person, whether a man or woman, in seeking to attain complete enlightenment, were to earnestly and faithfully observe and study even a single section of this sutra and explain it to others, the accumulated blessing and merit of that latter person would be far greater. Sabuti, how can one explain this sutra to others without holding in mind any arbitrary conception of forms or phenomena or spiritual truths? It can only be done, Sabuti, by keeping the mind in perfect tranquility and free from any attachment to appearances. So I say to you, this is how to contemplate our conditioned existence in this fleeting world. Like a tiny drop of dew, or a bubble floating in a stream, like a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, or a flickering lamp, an illusion, a phantom, or a dream, so is all conditioned existence to be seen. Thus spoke Buddha. All conditioned existence. Does, uh, he doesn't. Does, does that mean anything in particular, or does it mean? Um, yeah. So conditioned existence. Uh, I think what what they're meaning by that. Uh, I mean, of course, it's an English translation of the original but uh, uh when you think of it you can think of the conditioned mind um the conditioned mind would be like the what the ego how the ego would perceive you know like this this is a bottle to the conditioned mind yeah to the unconditioned mind it's just like the bundle of per perceptions that are there in that split second so when he's saying like it's like a flash of lightning in a cloud, that's what the conditioned existence is. It's just a, a temporary way of making sense of experience that occurs based upon the conditions that are there at the time of like me being a human being, having the word for a water bottle, me thinking it's a water bottle, me believing it's a water bottle, me having a bunch of experiences, of what water bottles are and what they do. He's saying all of that is just a temporary way of looking at experience and uh, it all will pass away. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, the impression I got. Uh, like uh, when he, he talked about the lightning, it's like yeah, yeah, similar to what I said about fireworks. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. I, it, it seems like because there was a lot, lot of repetition, it's like they were trying to mm -hmm. hammer hammer in this idea that everything is basically motion, nothing is standing still, and uh, so you cannot really speak of 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 things as if they are permanent. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's like process uh, logic, you know. Um, yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it, um, for, but, but from my opinion. Is, uh, by by focusing so much on that, one one thing that uh, I often ask uh, in these kinds of um, teachings is like, 
yeah, how they consider, you know, the, the, the question of survival, like does that matter at all? Uh, and also mm. doing in general, like uh, what a person, like is there, like what is like the point of existence once you go, once you grasp this? Like well, what do I, with I, it I, then, so to speak? I guess uh, one way you could answer that question that, um, you know, I would give is the point of existence is existence as it is right now. There, there doesn't need to be this this uh, extra point that we create for it. Um, just the process as it occurs, if it's seen for what it really is without all of the labels and conditionings, is a pretty ridiculously magnificent thing if it's beheld in that way. Um, so that's that's kind of what I would say. That's like my interpretation of these teachings is they don't point to there being some concrete thing. And you could say this kind of aligns a lot with existentialist philosophy too, that there isn't some like objective point of, of, of reality or of existence. It's more that's something you're going to find out for yourself in your own process of going through it. So um, it's very uh, contrary to uh, a belief system such as Christianity that would say that there is some point of existence and here's what it is and it's a definite thing and it's concrete and and there it is. These types of teachings are a lot more fluid and they allow for um, more subjective meaning to be created in it. Um, if that if that explains it. Yeah, well, it's sort sure. of the, uh, similar to the conclusion that I have reached that uh, it's like being receptive to this flow, whatever arises, is sort of mm -hmm. like the point. I sometimes talk of the meaning of existence as being surprises. Mm. Uh, which yeah, comes I, I like along that way of saying it. Okay, is there something span. more uh, you wanted to say? Um, uh, no, I mean, I... I... Uh, enjoyed going through this with you. It was nice for me to kind of refresh my memory with it. Um, and yeah, I hope you got some value out of it too. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm good to end it here if, if you are, or at least the recording. If you have anything yeah. else you want to say to me, we can afterwards. No, I think it's, uh, I mean, basically the only thing I have to say after having listened to this is that yeah, it, it's very much, uh, I mean, it's a, a kind of an old language, an old way of um, framing it. But I do think that, yeah, I think that th these kinds of teachings uh, are very interesting and relevant, but they need to be often updated for like, mm, yeah. in a more modern way of express expression. Yeah, and, and using more modern examples rather than, you know, like... like not everybody has a good picture of what the Ganges River is like and you yeah. know, for just a simple way, you know, like the And that's the thing, like the, the essence of the teaching can always be portrayed in a different way, like a different kind of form, you know, for like a more modern audience or a more Western audience or whatever. So, I mean, yeah, that's something that this teaching doesn't really offer just because it's from such a long time ago uh, in a different cultural context. But um yeah, the same ideas, uh, it can be explained even without the notion of spirituality, in my opinion. Uh, what what these teachings get at is just something very basic that really everybody is connected to. Um, it's just the there's a question of how do you get someone to actually see it? You know, commonly there's like the saying, enlightenment is like right under your nose. And what that kind of means is like experience enlightened is pretty much the same as experience unenlightened. The whole point is just to get to look at experience and just see what it really is and let it do its thing uh, is kind of one way I would say it. And it's like when you can see it that way, the resistance between like you and the world, you and the your challenges, you and your suffering a lot of the resistance can kind of fall away of its own accord when like you just see things working as they work. 
and you realize that it's just a process going on. And yeah, the, the, the ego structure, character, whatever has a role to play in that. But, um, when that sort of ownership and like solidification of a self structure, it gets diminished. Uh, I think it can just naturally, uh, create more joy and just, uh, presence and a, a, a more pleasant experience.